Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, we're gonna be reviewing the Year of Sanderson Kickstarter campaign and the books that came in the boxes. I feel like it's pretty well known, but Brandon Sanderson last year did a Kickstarter campaign to get out these four books that he wrote unexpectedly during COVID because he had so much extra time. Because what else are you gonna do than write four books? It is wild. There were a couple of different ways that you could support the Kickstarter. One of them included getting 12 months of boxes, including swag boxes, the months that you weren't getting one of the four books. I did not do that. I just got the four quarterly book boxes. I've now read all four books. So here's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to talk about whether it was worth the amount of money that I paid. I paid $200 towards the Kickstarter. 40 of that went to shipping costs. So about $10 per box, which seems very reasonable. And 160 of it went to the books, which means I was paying about $40 per box plus shipping. So what did I think of the boxes? Do I think it was worth what I paid for it? And what did I think of the four books that I purchased and read? It's worth Worth noting that that price includes not only the book and a few goodies that came in each box, but also the ebook version of each book. So for $200, you get the fancy physical book, the ebook, and a couple of little goodies that are included in the boxes. I did detailed unboxing shorts for each of these books, which was really fun. So I'm gonna intersperse those here. You'll see it before I review the book. You'll get to see the unboxing and the art flip throughs if you're interested. The first book that came was Tress of the Emerald Sea. And I do wanna note that the quality of these is very high. They are premium hardcovers. They're all very beautiful. The artwork is gorgeous. The end papers are gorgeous. There's just so many small details that you can tell they put a lot of time and thought into it. Each box also came with a bookmark and a pin, which was fun. And the first box came with a second bookmark, which I had in here, um, but it's this like giant world hopper bookmark with Hoyd. So, so in terms of quality, do I think it was worth the price? I would say absolutely. I feel like you definitely get what you're paying for in terms of the quality of the book, the added goodies. It feels like a very premium experience. And so paying $40 for something like this for full size hardcovers to me seemed really reasonable, especially because you're also getting the Kindle version included as well. I definitely think it was worth the cost. But what about the books? They're beautiful physically, yes, but did I like actually reading the books? And that's a little bit of a mixed bag. So I'm going to go through and review all four of the books and my thoughts on them. For context, I am not a Brandon Sanderson super fan. I have read some of his books, but I have not by any means read all of them or even close to all of them. So this perspective is coming from somebody who admittedly has read only scattered books in the Cosmere or in some of his other series. I do enjoy his books for the most part, although I find some of them to be a little overly long, especially when we're talking about the Stormlight Archive, which I have read the first two books of, and that's going to become important later on. If you're watching this and you are a Brandon Sanderson super fan, you will probably understand why. But to begin, let's talk about Tress of the Emerald Sea, the first book that we got in the quarterly boxes. <laughs> this book got a mixed reception depending on what people like and what people were expecting. I 
loved Tress of the Emerald Sea. This was inspired by a conversation he had with his wife, and it's basically a gender-flipped Princess Bride retelling, but in a very different fantasy world. And I love it. I think it's really cool. It's like, what if instead Buttercup went to try to find and save Wesley? It's like that, except not exactly, because it's, you know, very different in some ways. I just found this to be so charming and cozy. I really enjoyed the characters. I liked the world. I thought the mechanics of the world were really interesting. And this to me reminds me a lot of classic cozy fantasy tales that are really rereadable. This is the kind of thing that in a couple years I could see reading aloud to my kids. I think it would go really well. It's such a fun adventure story and I really enjoyed it. I do think this book sometimes gets a little heavy-handed with the social commentary and even though I agree with the commentary he's making, there are moments where it feels a little bit preachy and overdone in the text. So it wasn't my favorite book of the four that we got, but I did really enjoy it. I have very fond feelings towards it and I even now have a second copy for reading purposes since this is a little bit more of a display copy because it's so nice. So Tress of the Emerald Sea was definitely a hit. I didn't know what to expect exactly going into these books but package one was a success. In quarter two we got The Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. <music> very different. It is a little bit more comedic. It's not set in Sanderson's Cosmere or kind of universe that a lot of his worlds are set in, and it's experimental. I imagine this was probably a lot of fun for him to write. It was not my favorite. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I think my favorite thing about this was all the little illustrations, which were very cute. It's amazing, honestly. There are so many illustrations in here, and they're really fun. I love the art style. I do think it really works for the book that it is. And I think the concept is a fun one. This is the kind of book that I could see going back to later and maybe appreciating more than I did the first time now that I kind of know what to expect. Unfortunately, I feel like this book is riding a lot on its humor. And while Sanderson's humor sometimes works for me, in this case for me it just really wasn't hitting. And based on reviews it seems like whether you're going to get on with this book is going to have a lot to do with whether the sense of humor or the style of the humor works for you. Humor is very subjective and very personal. For me this just really wasn't working. I didn't feel invested in the main character and in what was happening, and so it was just a disappointing experience for me. That said, and I'm it's been a minute since I've read it, so I'm going back and taking a look at my Goodreads review for this. I said I'm sure it doesn't help that I'm a hard sell on this kind of memory loss premise where someone slowly recovers their identity, which is the whole point of it. I get that that was what he wanted to do. He wanted wanted to play with an amnesia trope, and I respect that. I feel like as a writer it's probably good to try different things and experiment with your writing from time to time. It's just not my personal favorite type of story. I'll be honest, this is not a book that has really stuck with me, so I had some criticisms in my Goodreads review. I don't remember a lot of the details now about why I felt the way that I felt, and I feel like if anything that probably says something. Tress of the Emerald Sea, I remember a lot about it. It really stuck with me. Same with one of the other books we're going to talk about, but this I was just kind of bored. I wasn't really into it, wasn't super enjoying it. It really reads like something he probably had a lot of fun writing, but for me it wasn't a very fun reading experience. It was a two star for me. But then we got what is, in my opinion, the best book of the year. And this was maybe my biggest surprise because it made it on my list of personal favorite books that I read in the year, and that is Yumi and the Nightmare Painter.
my god, I loved this so much. It's so good. And I think what's interesting about it is that this is something that Brandon Sanderson said that he really wrote for his wife. It's something that is really heavy on the romance and he does it so well. I loved it. It's this really slow burn romance with interesting sci fantasy elements to it about two people who live in different worlds as far as they know who start weirdly inhabiting the other person's body and then communicating. It's kind of complicated. The artwork is really stunning. It takes its inspiration from manga and apparently even the story as well takes its inspiration from a manga, although I'm not familiar with the specific one, but he does credit that. I was so impressed with this. I loved it. I was rooting for the characters. I was really into the twists and turns of the story. I thought that the world building elements were fascinating and really well executed. This just gave me everything that I wanted. And as much as I like Brandon Sanderson's books, his books usually aren't favorites for me. So this was a very pleasant surprise that it was one of my favorite things that I read this year. Absolutely loved it and I would love to see him write more of this. I feel like he's surprisingly pretty good at this kind of a romance when he tries. Lastly, we got The Sunlit Man. This one has black sprayed edges, which is fun. The other ones do not have sprayed edges, so if you're into that. <laughs> love The Sunlit Man, I'll be honest. And I think there are several reasons for this. One is, again, in this year, he was really experimenting with different styles and tropes. And in this case, as he says in his author's note at the end, he was experimenting with pacing. He wanted to do an action adventure that's at this breakneck speed where you have constant action. And that's, that is in fact what he did. <laughs> it's not the kind of book that I like to read. I am a really hard sell on breakneck action adventure stories. I find them boring. And so I ended up having a really hard time keeping my attention on this. I listened to the audiobook and I kept having to rewind it and go back to the beginning of the chapter because like my my brain would stop paying attention and I'd go back and like re-listen and like pick up the trail again of what had been going on. Now, if you love really action-driven narratives, you might be more into this. The other thing about this though is, and, and I read a review from Petrick that I will link down below on Goodreads that I think is very insightful about where this book stands, is that this is the one book in the group that you can't really read as a standalone. It's a book that is a Cosmere book that is closely related to other books that have been written, especially in the Stormlight Archive. It had been said that you needed to at least read the first two books of the Stormlight Archive series before reading this, and so I did do that. And I feel like because of that I got a good bit of the context, but this is a character who shows up in the Stormlight Archive, and also this is something that takes place after books that haven't come out yet and are referencing events that happen in books that haven't come out yet. And so that is a little bit complicated for a reader who, one, hasn't even finished all of the existing books in the Stormlight Archive series, but even for somebody who has, this is still so heavily reliant on something that we don't really know about in terms of making you care about the character and care about what they're doing. And so for me this just wasn't very enjoyable to read. Again, I think it was probably fun for him to experiment with this kind of a fast-paced action story, but for me it wasn't that fun to read. It was interspersed with sort of sci-fi info dumping, 
which, which I also don't love. I don't mind that he does it sometimes because usually I'm invested enough in other parts of the story that I'm like, yeah, okay, we're info dumping about a thing now, whatever, we'll get to something I like. But unfortunately, in this case, it was like, we're info dumping, which mm, not super interesting. And then we're doing action without a lot of slower character moments or context that made me really care about these characters and what was going on. So the only thing that would really make me care about this character is knowing him from Stormlight Archive, and he's not one of my favorite characters. I'm not that invested. Eh, it was, it was fine. It was fine. This is another, like, two star for me, if I'm being honest. That said, I feel like your mileage may vary on this depending on your taste and depending on how far into the series you've read. All right, so in total, we got these four books in the year of Sanderson. Physically, they are all absolutely stunning. The artwork is gorgeous. All of the touches on the covers and the end papers and the, the fonts that are used, everything is just so beautiful and so thoughtful. And so I feel like as a physical object, these do feel very much worth the money that was spent on them. In terms of the stories themselves, it was more of a mixed bag for me. These two, The Sunlit Man and The Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England, I was not the biggest fan of. Both of them were two star reads for me, which is fairly low. I didn't find them particularly enjoyable, but it was still kind of fun to read them just because so many other people were also reading them as they were getting their Kickstarter books. And so I'm not mad that I read either of these. I didn't hate either one of them, but I, mm, they, they, were, they were just okay. On the other hand, I loved Tress of the Emerald Sea and Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. And Tress of the Emerald Sea is one that I think when I first read it, I gave it like a four and a half star, but on a reread, I could see it even going up from there. So these two are both books that I really enjoyed reading. I had such a good time with them. I would reread them. I have another copy of Tress of the Emerald Sea because I liked it so much and want to share it with my kids. I feel like that was definitely a success. So overall, do I think it was worth the $200? I would say yes. I think in terms of the physical products that I got, it was worth it. And also just in terms of the experience, it was worth that. I had a lot of fun getting to open the books and experience the books in this way and be part of a community that was doing it. I think it was really cool. Am I going to keep all four of these? Probably not. I'll probably go ahead and sell the two that I didn't love and pass them on to somebody else. Maybe I'll change my mind. I'm going to like sit on it for a bit, but I'm thinking that's probably what I'm going to do, especially because I still have the eBooks and I ended up purchasing the audiobooks. So do I really need the fancy editions on my shelves? Eh, I don't know. But I am thrilled about these two and they more than make up for the two that were just okay. That was my experience with the year of Sanderson. In general, I would say it was pretty positive on the whole, even though I didn't love two of the books. Talk to me in the comments down below and let me know any of your thoughts. Did you participate? Did you read the books? What did you think? Did you feel like it was worth the amount that you paid in the Kickstarter? Did you enjoy the books? Did you react differently than I did? to reading some of them, let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.